Yes, we are live once again here at the Reinchi Connect podcast. I'm your host, Keenan Hudson. We're here with the Purposely Driven with Miss Samantha Saro. Yes, another good Hello. story. Hello. Another good story. We're going to be introducing her right in a second. But thank you all for joining in tonight once again. Yes, but you know, before we get started, got to give a shout out to GPS Transportation. GPS Transportation.net at 215. 774-9913. Yes, they're top of the line, five-star transportation all over the city of Philadelphia, tri-states, anywhere you want to go, anything you want to do, group trips. If they want to go to Atlantic City, wheelchair accessible, I'm talking about party buses and everything, you feel free to reach out to them. Mention the Reentry Connect podcast, and they will be sure to give you a great rate. Great rate. Shout out to One Day at a Time, Mr. Mel Wells. We appreciate you doing a lot in the community. Uh, tune in if you have any type of um, needs or if you need any resources concerning re- support help, uh, reentry support. Uh, if you need some recovery support, reach out to them for all the resources and one day at a time. We appreciate you. Now back to the story. Yes, we have Miss Samantha. Miss Samantha, go ahead and tell us who you are and where you're from. Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Samantha Saro. I am from New York, currently in the state of Florida. Um, I found out about Kenan through a mutual friend that is a part of reentry as well. And um, we connected as a result of that. Um, I'm very passionate about uh, the recovery process, the reentry process, due to the fact that I myself am formerly incarcerated. I spent three years up north, New York State, upstate. Um, I was in Bedford, Beacon, Albion, Lakeview. So, so yeah. Samantha, before before you get on to 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 the to the to the to the, to the good stuff, right? Let me ask. What was your childhood like growing up? Okay. What experiences did you have? You know, did you have your mother? Did you have your father? Um, how was life growing up? Were you, a, were you the only child or did you have siblings? Let's share some of that about yourself. Okay. So my background. Okay. Yeah. Um, I come from a single parent. Um, my mom had five kids. My Eldest sister was born in 61. I was born in 81. Just to give you a context, my mother had three children back to back, waited nine years, had another, waited another five years, had another. So I have three siblings that are almost 20 years older than me. And then one, which is only five years older. Um, Being that my mother was a single mother, um, we all pretty much fended for ourselves because she worked. She called herself using the system, you know, and they kept her in this box. So, you know, it was like they helped her with paying for rent, but she couldn't make too much money. Otherwise they wouldn't help for rent. So that left us in low income communities. And, um, I guess kind of like white trash. I'm sorry for the title, but the reality is mm-hmm. that that's how I was raised, you know, dirt bag. And um, we moved around a lot. I just recently found out that we were technically considered homeless until I was 13 years old because we didn't live in any one place for longer than a year. So technically, we were homeless from the time that I was born until I was 13. Mm -hmm. Um, But apparently, that had been my mother's life story until she got that good old Section 8. And... um, I say this to say because it sounds really bleak and and like womp womp, but my mom didn't do drugs. My mom wasn't a bad woman. She was born and raised in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Her mother was an orphan. So my mom did do the best that she could with what she had. But unfortunately, she didn't really have a lot of resources or information. So therefore, it was the blind leading the blind. She had children. She, She wound up getting with men that weren't men. And and so therefore she just had to try to figure things out. Part of doing this, unfortunately, two of my siblings were late teenagers in the early eighties and twenties in the early eighties. So they got involved with the crack epidemic. At this point, my mom was just done with parenting. Here I am, I've got all these older siblings. She figures they can raise me 
she's just done. She don't want to deal with us. Also, she worked and she enmeshed herself in working and gambling. Mm -hmm. And um, me being really young, you know, again, crack, right? So I knew the process of cleaning a crack pipe by the time that I was five, because I would see my brother do this stuff and light this fire. And as a kid, you're just like, whoa, you know, you think you're, they're doing something amazing. And then all of a sudden, like, poof, they become zombies. And so it wasn't, I didn't even understand what was going on. I was just a child. Um, as I got older, I noticed that, you know, the guys who were coming to serve them, you know, they came, they came in very home, you know, regular, schmegula, basic clothes, cars and everything. And I'm seeing that as these people are frequenting my home that, you know, they're getting fatter while my siblings are getting skinnier, you know, they're getting larger while these people are getting smaller. So at a very young, impressionable age, I made a decision that I wanted to be like the people who were coming to the house and not the people who lived at the house, right? Wow. I've seen Scarface, I've seen New Jack City, and I was 11 years old when I seen New Jack City. And I'll never forget sitting there eating the two-for-one Whopper with my sister, and we watched that, and that became our platform. That became our Bible, our manuscript wow. on how to move. And here it is, just two... Very, you know, you would never suspect either one of us. We just look like two very innocent little white girls. You would never consider that they have dreams of becoming the next Tanya Montana. So, <laughs> so, so, so let me get this right. So you grew up in the city of New York. Uh, you say you didn't have the best upbringing. You know, your mother, you know, failed you in a lot of ways. You were exposed to a lot of the drug pandemic, the drug epidemic per se. Um, of course, the crack era, you know, that was huge back in the 80s and things like that because I witnessed it too because my father was on crack as well. Um, sure. So you went through all these things, but however, you came to an age where you were able to rationalize and say, hey, I wanted to be something. And that something was the opposite of what was going on in your household. Correct. You wanted to be what was coming to your household, the person that was dropping the things off. Correct. You now here it is, you and your sister decided to make a decision in your life. With the information we had. And what did that process look like? Right, so for me it started out, you know, I was boosting, I was boosting by the time that I was 11, going into Caldors, taking out electronics, selling them to the same people I've seen the crack kids selling them to, you know, um, that's how I started making my first amount of money. And then by the time that I was 13 is when I started dipping into my sister's stash because I would sometimes help her out. And uh, when she had to work or go away for the weekend, so I learned how to start maneuvering, um, you know, break off a couple of points, hit them with that, you know, for that price. And now I got a couple of points. And the next time I break off a couple of points. So now I got my own thing and I'm learning this. I'm only 13 to 15 is the, the, the process of where I actually started building my little business, mm -hmm. not even being conscious of the fact that what I am doing is actually creating a business. I am creating a, a good for or service or whatever, you know, for people. And again, I, I really did not realize what I was doing at that moment. And, you know, I expanded and things like that. And then I had a kid at 15 and now I got to go even harder and I got to do even more. And after some time of me really, really, really getting involved heavily, I wound up with this great connect and it was so weird how it happened, you know, at the gas station, this kid approaches me, got a nice car, this and that, never seen him before. I'm like, okay, he becomes my Rhea man. And apparently he was the police. Uh, <laughs> he was wow, the police. The whole time he was undercover on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the thing. It wasn't just me. It was six other people that he had brought down. He, he wasn't a real police officer. He was an informant. He was a legit CI. Wow. And so 
he had actually been going through Long Island doing this to people. And to this day, people know who he is and know the things that he does and still deals with him. So at that point, I was only 20. I had, yeah, it was right before my 21st birthday wow, that so I realized. Had, so you had a child that was already six years old around this time. And he yeah. was still involved in the game. Yeah, I worked four jobs. I hustled. I I tried going to school in the process of all of this. I never once got welfare. I've been a mother since I've been 15 years old. I've never mm. once got help from the state. I never mm. once got child support from her father. Um, because of all of the nonsense I've seen my mother go through with getting stuck in their box, I just, my pride wouldn't allow me to, I legit would feel choked up like somebody was strangling me anytime that I went to them people to ask them for help. So, you, so had, you had the you had the spirit of a go getter. You you just want to be that entrepreneur, whereas you didn't accept any handouts. You went and chased what you wanted. Right, I was a survivor. Survivor, gotcha. Yeah, I mm -hmm. am a survivor. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Because honestly, through all of these different things that I've done in my life, you know, I've also went to therapy because every time you get in trouble for drugs, they make you do therapy, like drug counseling in New York. So. so bring that up. So now when you went through these things, you say you were about 21 when this situation happened, when you encountered a confidential informant, but then there came a time where you wound up going to prison. So Yeah, that was way, way later on down the road. We didn't even oh, get there yet. We didn't even get there yet. So you were still in the game full force. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, that's <laughs> tell, tell us what happened. Tell us what okay, happened. Okay, so from twelve to from twelve to twenty one, I had a gazillion Pence petitions put on me. I had then, you know, once I had my kid, I was now emancipated. So therefore, you know, no more pins, but now I'm getting pulled over all the time. I'm getting arrested for assault on my drug addict sister. I now have the drug charges. You know, I got all these things. I have a, a, a jacket like this thick by the time I'm 21. And the thing is, I didn't even make the handoff to the cop. So how I wound up getting caught up was really dumb, but it's okay. And I took that. I took that just because of the fact that I knew where I was in life and I needed a reason to really slow down. I had a little kid. So now with that being said, I call myself slowing down. Obviously, I need another occupation. Drug dealing ain't it for me. <laughs> this ain't like the movies. This is real life. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just don't want that for myself. So. I decided to go back to school and now I become a role model student. I am on the front and center of the college handbook. I got a 3.6 to a 3.9 GPA. At one point it peaked to 3.9. So, um, you know, I, I was a peer mentor leader, orientation leader, like I'm doing everything I need to do, except I didn't leave people, places and things alone. So, I was in love with a drug dealer, but as long as I didn't know what he was doing, how could that hurt me? There's like no way possible I could be condemned for what somebody else does. I'm not around him when he's doing it. He knows not to make no runs with me. We're fine. We're good. Okay. Five years later, <laughs> five years later, I'm in this relationship with this man that I know does things, but I don't want to know about. Um, and apparently the feds knew everything about. So there was this huge drug bust, April of 2007 in Southampton, Long Island. I was caught up in the Shinnecock drug raid. They called me a queen pin. They said I was trafficking. Now, mind you, this is somebody who turned their life around and is doing everything right. And given where I've come from, I mean, of course, I'm going to know people like you can't tell me to not know anybody. So I didn't know that I was doing anything wrong. They um, so they came for him. Then they came for me. I happened to not see the news that morning. Otherwise, I would have known that I was about to be got um, nonetheless. So they come and they get me. They tackle me in front of my mother's house. It's a whole SWAT team. It's uh, the Secret Service is involved um, because there's Indians, you know. So it's just this big federal thing. The casinos were a thing. So there was just so much going on. And again, this is federal. 
So they bring me in. This is like something I'm seeing on TV. I'm thinking this is candid camera. I'm not doing anything. And they just kept on saying, who do you, who, who do you hang with? Who do you hang with? Who do you hang with? And when I get to the, the state trooper barracks, I see all these Indians, but I don't see my, my ex. So I don't know what the hell is going on. And I happened to see somebody I did know from the streets. And it was like, fuck you doing here. I don't know. And, uh, that's just to paint a picture that I'm in a situation that I'm totally oblivious as to how I could be here. And people from the street that know me know, like, you don't belong here. Why are you here? Gotcha. Um, so now they bring me in the back room after trying to scare me by showing me, letting me see all this craziness. I see the TV. I see the news reporters. Like, this is crazy. Um, and they bring me in and they're telling me they've got me on transporting heroin. Now, I need to just back up and pause for a second. Um, I don't like that drug. I wanted to sell every drug under the sun except that drug. That particular drug was something that, you know, this drug dealer moral code, you just don't do certain things. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but... That wasn't something I was into. So I'm like, they have nothing on me. Well, lo and behold, there is a charge called an overact, conspiracy overact, which means you're acting innocently in the furtherance of a crime. So now I'm, I'm going to go to prison for acting innocently. What? How, Sway? No way possible. I need the best damn lawyer my money could buy. I'm out of here tomorrow. So I wind up with the biggest drug attorney in Long Island. He takes $7,000, can't even get me a motion of discovery. I still don't know why I'm in jail. Eight months later, I get an 18B. That's when he tells me exactly why I sat in jail for eight months for acting innocently. That's all I knew. That's all I knew for eight months. Wow. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking to somebody who's going to school, who's doing everything right, who's being a good mom, who's being a good daughter, who, who's doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm sitting in jail and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nobody can give me a reason. I was in love with a drug dealer. That's not a good enough reason. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. So now I finally get this lawyer who gets me our reward. I get home, I get the motion of discovery, the CD-ROM, and I get to hear me talking to my ex. He's telling me that the reason why he's not coming home right now is because he gotta make money. I like having nice things. He pays my rent. I got a BMW, I got a make, I got all of this. Let a man be a man and do what a man gotta do. Well, there goes me knowing of the crime. Me admitting to him paying for my rent is me benefiting from the crime. I'm now illegal. Uh, yeah, I, I did something illegal. Yeah. Wow. So that really happened. And he saw, he wrote statements and everything that I had nothing to do with what he had going on. But because I had a previous record and this fit my M.O., they were able to hit me with an E felony and still send me up north for almost three years. I had a one and a half to three and I got hit at the parole board and they made me CR on that. So now insult to injury. I go through all of this nonsense. I sit home for eight months. I fight it from home for eight months. I'm not getting anywhere. I got to take this E felony. I'm going to go up North and I'm only going to do four months in Willard. I get up North department of corrections tells me that this is a whole different story. He doesn't care what my attorney told me that I am going to shock. That's a six month program. And I better not get recycled because somebody's in there right now, three times over. So six months to however long you make it, I get there to shock. The people is calling us all kinds of crackheads, throwing mail at people. Listen, first off, I know respect and I know how to, yes, ma'am, no, sir. And, and I know my lane and I know how to conduct myself in each and every atmosphere I go into because like I said before, I'm a survivor and I've known, I've learned how to adapt and to make myself get through situations. So I'm there, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm being respectful and you're talking to me crazy. So that's not going to work. So needless to say, it didn't work. You know, I didn't, I didn't take kindly to being called a crackhead. I'm not a crackhead. Check your facts. Google me. I paid your bill, sir. 
humble yourself. Mm -hmm. I guess you're not supposed to tell that to CEOs. They want to yoke you up. You putting your hands on me. You want to die. Like, I'm not fighting you, but keep your fucking hands off of me. That's mm -hmm. how it went. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> I ain't even supposed to be so, here, man. So, so let me ask you this. So when you went to prison, so you were convicted, correct? They convicted yeah. you something like once you found the understanding of why they convicted you. So now... Throughout this prison process, right, was it at a certain point where you say, you know what, I'm not going to deal with any drug dealers anymore. I'm going to change my life around and I'm going to actually go into the actual field of entrepreneurship once you were released or what went, what went through your mind throughout that time? <laughs> um, I don't know. I was in utter shock. I was completely lost. Everything that I thought I knew, I didn't know. Um, you know, everything that you learn about, they have to shut off wiretaps after 60 seconds. No, they don't. You know, you if you don't, what you don't know can't hurt you. That's a lie. You know, I'm just grateful for the fact that I have been praying and turning to God since I've been 13 on my own. I just always knew that there had to be something bigger. And I think that that is what got me through shortly after I had got into Riverhead. Mm -hmm. um, I just remember crying one night hysterically in my, in my cell. Like I, I just couldn't believe it. You know, Mother's Day, my daughter's birthday, everything was just coming and, and there and I'm here and I don't know why. And um, I opened up to Isaiah 54 and, and he told me he would be my husband. And he told me that he was going to raise my tent and he was going to use, you know, my he was going to give me beauty for my ashes. So, you know, I, I stood on that. I stood on that. And every time I started to lose faith, you know, a scripture, um, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That scripture would just find me in the weirdest times, weirdest places. And so I knew he had me. So now in this interim, no, I didn't think I was going to come home and be a business person. As a matter of fact, I thought that I was completely done for. I was just in the newspaper. Everybody's seen my face. I couldn't get a job with one felony. How the hell am I going to get one with two? My life is over. I can't be a CPA. This isn't going to happen. Like I thought that I was really going to be a welfare waif. So now moving forward, you know, I wind up going to prison. I got to go through all of these different classes. They make you go through upon you getting ready to come home. They tell you that there's all these re-entry programs out here for us that, you know, we have all these opportunities. Well, lo and behold, nonsense. No, we don't. They're not here. It's, it's BS. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give me one second, please? Sure, sure. No one problem. second. Sorry. Go back with the Reentry Connect podcast. I'm your host, Keenan Hudson. She's going to be coming back. Again, shout out to GPS Transportation.net. Yeah, it's a five-star transportation company here in the city of Philadelphia. However, they serve everywhere. If you have wheelchair accessibles, if you need your parents or somebody to get to a, a wheelchair appointment, if you need private transportation, security transportation, or even a luxury party bus, Feel free to contact this number on the screen. Yes, GPS Transportation. They're one of the best around. You can Google their five star. They'll be the first one to pop up. And another shout out back to Old Dad, one day at a time. We appreciate you, Mel Wells, at 215-226-7860. Yes, and uh, we're going to be having Miss Samantha right back right now. But right now, she's just giving us a recap on the things that she's been through. She's been through a lot of things in life. She's been through um, exposed to the, the drug epidemic, um, even going through with her wanting to be a drug dealer herself, wound up having a child at the age of 15, and from there, you know, moving on, trying to change her life, but still wind up getting sucked back in by guilty by association, more so, you can say. And we know that from her story, a lot of individuals can probably relate in some type of way. And again, this podcast is based on testimonies of others, others that will give inspiration and what they've been through in the past 
by however, however they made it out of. This actual show is called Pur Purposely Driven. There's a lot of things that we may go through. There's a certain quote that says, you know, that all things work together for the good, right? No matter what. If, you know, to those who love their creator, to them who love the creator. So, so no matter what you go through in life, whether it be good or bad, whether it be up or down, whether, you know, all of it's going to fuse together for a common good. And she's leading up to that point. We have her back um, now. She's going to explain how, you know, they, they try to say that there was programs and reentry programs and things. They lied to her, but she still found a way in some way. So I yeah. want to continue to share. So once you came home, you, yeah. I'm quite sure you, you rekindled the relationship with your daughter. Let people know how did you get back with your daughter, your connection with your kids, and um, and how did you find help eventually once you came out? Okay. So my mother held my daughter down for me. Um, I was fortunate enough to have that luxury of having a parent to help me with my child. So that was seamless, the, the reconnection. And my daughter... Um, you know, kind of growing up with me, you know, mm -hmm. I went away. She was 10. I came home. She's 13. That's a very, very crucial time in a kid's life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I left and she was a kid and I come home and she's a young woman. And that lapse of time, just, I didn't get phone calls. I, I got two visits the whole entire time I was gone. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really isolating that situation. And, and, it's not because my mom didn't care. We didn't have money for a minute. And all these people that know you, nobody went and checked in on them to make sure they were okay. And, and the money that I gave my mom to, to hold my daughter down before I left, like that wasn't for phone calls and sneakers and commissary. That was for my mom to take care of my kid. And, and whenever anybody did send me money, I was sending that home to my kid um, just because I felt terrible not being a parent to her. So. She wasn't angry at me or nothing. I expected it. However, I'll tell you later on how all of this actually turns around. So now, um, you know, me and her, we did fine. It was, I came home. They told me there was all these programs available to people with reentry. You know, I'd be able to get social services, get my Medicaid, get my apartment. Everything would be okay. Blah, 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 blah. I get home, I tell them I have nowhere to go because my mom's on Section 8, I can't live in Section 8 house. So I tell them I have nowhere to go. They put me in this basically abandoned house. There were, it was no furniture, not even a roll of toilet paper in this house, no cups to drink water. I mean, there was nothing. I slept on my North Face. Uh, I slept on my sweater rolled up and my North Face jacket over me in this house, right? I just came home. And... <laughs> mm -hmm. I go to social services the next day, like, you realize what you put me in? Like, there's nothing there. And they're like, no, everything is covered. That house has everything that it needs, blah, 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 blah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And, and I'm so grateful that I had money put away for myself, that I had always been that kind of person again. Because when you come from nothing, yeah. it's a fear mm -hmm. to ever be with nothing again. So you do things in preparation for. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. that's my, you know, and, and so fortunately enough, I did have something, but to those people's knowledge, I had nothing. And, you know, I remember yelling at them, like, you gotta be kidding me. How do people come home? And this is what you're giving. There's nothing there. This isn't fair. And, you know, I'm yelling at them. I'm up at a welfare building acting crazy. Mm -hmm. So I got to go to parole. Now, mind you, I'm walking around too prideful to ask anybody for rides or whatever. I'm walking in the middle of winter, miles. Now, mind you, I was I, I, I made money. I drove around in a BMW. I had a mink coat. I had pony skin boots. I'm walking with a damn suitcase down the road in my neighborhood because I don't have enough sense to ask anybody for nothing because nobody seemed to give a damn while I was gone. So why, why even bother with them now? I don't want no parts. Whatever. I'll, I'll figure it out. I see my old, somebody used to make money way back in the day. I, I'm a, trying to avoid him because I don't want to go backwards. He is like, yo, what's going on with you? Why are you acting like you, you don't know anybody? And I tell him I'm trying to stay focused. He was like, my chill. I'm in the union. I, 
I don't know what you talking about. I'm like, what do you mean you in a union? And uh, he tells me they have a reentry program here. Wow. I, she was going to let me go all the way to Brooklyn. She was going to let me take the train an hour and a half to go into the city to access resources from the city because there was none in my local community. And yet there was. And, and it was like a secret. A secret? A secret. Like, wow. I guess. And, and the whole reason, now let me tell you, while I was up north, they had me doing the grounds crew. I was getting paid 16 cents an hour to be a landscaper. But I liked it. I liked it. <laughs> it allowed me to be outside. I was, you know, in touch with the earth. It just, it felt, it felt nice. So now I was down to use my hands and make perhaps $16 an hour. So that's why I was going to go into this city because I knew that the city had this program called new non-traditional employment for women. And I'm going to go to new in the city and I'm going to go try to get me a manual labor job, right? Because social services is BS. They're not going to help me. Mm -hmm. So she gives me permission to go into the city. So now I see somebody locally. They tell me about this program locally. I go into the office and I'm like, there's a program here. She cocks her head to the side. She's Miss Sarah, you've been doing your homework. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> she says, I'm going to introduce you to somebody. She takes me to the back to meet this lady. The lady don't want to take my information. And I'm like, listen, please just give me a chance. I really, I, I need this. I have a daughter at home. I just really want to take care of, and I don't want to go backwards. So she takes my application. The lady who actually runs the program now wants to meet me because I, I surpassed anybody that's ever taken the math portion on the test. Um, I tell her that I was going to go take a trip to the city to go do this program called new. So I'm really grateful that I was able to find this here. She smiles and she cocks her head, smiles at me. She is the founder of new. So God is good. Wow. And, and, you know, there was even a time right before I came home, I was scared to come home because I didn't know what the hell I was coming home to. There was a house that I ran away from my whole entire life to, to no business ventures, uh, opportunities available, no, no financial support. I'm, I just, I don't know what the hell is going on. And I'm talking to God. I'm looking at the mountains like, what the hell am I going to do? And I'll never forget that man. I, I just feel like God came and hugged me. He, 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 he poured this like mm. hot Spirit. comfort, this hug, this, this, like this peace came over me that I, I, to this day, I can never forget it because it was just incredible. And I promise you that from the moment I got home and things were happening, I could understand where that peace came from because the way that things were forming, the way that things were happening, nothing was my first parole officer was good. My second parole officer, he wanted to take back my license. He wanted to mess up my curfew. He got pissed off that I got into the union right away. Mm -hmm. He he was totally against me having a job. He wanted me on mental health medication. Mm -hmm. This man was completely insane. And I'm going to his supervisor, telling his supervisor, like, lock me back up then. The man said I had a dirty urine. Meanwhile, I knew I didn't do anything and I made... I, I wound up, my old parole officer was walking down the hallway at the time I'm arguing with this man. And I'm like, Miss Johnson, please come in the bathroom with me. I didn't do nothing, please. So she comes in, she gives me a test. The shit is negative. Mm. Like the man had it out for me. And I didn't know this until a year later, nonetheless. So, so let me tell you. So now... I meet this lady. She introduces me. She she's part of this. The, she's um, a founder of this program that gets uh, minorities into the trades. Right? Mm -hmm. She did this in the city. Now she's doing this in Long Island um, because this is a thing. There's the Coalition for Black Men that apparently is all over America. Um, but there are these coalitions to help people like us and they're there, but you have to look, nobody's giving us the answers because mm -hmm. they have such limited resources that if they went and they told everybody about it, 
then the people who really would use it and need it and actually do something good with it, it wouldn't be there for those people because there's so many leeches that just want, 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 want the most for the least. Mm -hmm. So I can understand why they don't give that information to everybody because everybody who says that they want to do better doesn't really mean it. And it's sad, but it's the truth. And this is the truth that we need to look ourselves in the mirror and really get real with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Where are you trying to go? Stop telling people what you want to do and just do it. Just do it. Just do it. The white man ain't holding you down. The criminal justice ain't holding you down. The, yeah. the, the oppression isn't holding you down. Your daddy ain't holding you down. Your mama, your man, your anybody. Uh, it's on you. So with that yeah. being said, I had everything everything trying to come against me but then i also had everything working out for me all at the same time wow. Wow. And, and 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 then maybe a year later oprah's oprah started her new channel i get on to the life class with her do the little life class i wound up in the oprah magazine so i went from prison in 2010 to the oprah magazine in 2011 and and all of a sudden i'm like when they google me they're not gonna see drug bust they're gonna see this oprah magazine uh -huh. so i don't even care at this point i'm owning my felony like yeah i did it so what uh -huh. it's done you know because now I got confidence because I think that when we wind up with these things like felonies or bankruptcies or divorces or, or several baby fathers, <laughs> you feel like everybody is going to ostracize you. But the reality is I'm here to tell people that, okay, so I wound up in the union. I wound up making really good money. My parole officer at the end admitted to me that he was pissed off that I came home and made more money than he was making. Right. So he did give me hell. He admitted that to me. Um, so I say this to say that I came from nothing and I had everything come against me that said I should have stayed in nothing. However, I did everything that I did and I took what I wanted. And I even told them people at the union, I'm going to be a pimple on your ass until you give me a job. Every time you sit down, you're going to get a phone call from me. You're going to get a voicemail from me. Hell, you might even get a knock at your door from me. I promise you, I will not let you get any rest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you give me an opportunity. Yeah, that's, hey, listen, you 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 just explained some great points because listen, you just described what purposely driven means. You know, you didn't take no for an answer. You kept going. You kept persevering. You never gave up. A lot of people, you know, they get those, you know, those nut POs and the POs come and they harass them and then they wind up getting up saying something stupid or wind up going and, and then catching a hot yarn just, just because of some fact is they started stressing out. And, you know, but, but for you to, you know, to just constantly have the audacity to say, you know what? I'm going to make this change in my life. I got a door to take care of. I'm going to step out on faith because there's nobody giving me anything. That's like strength and willpower. Those who are listening, please take this story and run with it. This is showing how you can be something despite of. This is showing how you can constantly build yourself up in certain ways in which people are trying to tear you down. There's always going to be obstacles. We always mention that, you know, it's, it's, never, it's never going to be just easy. It's never going to be easy. However, if you stay focused, things will come to you over time, as is always is mentioned. But if you could continue, uh, Miss Samantha, of how once all these things started coming together, do you wind up starting a business and doing these things? Please give us, give us, give us some info. Okay. So now um get in the union, doing a great job with the union. Within five years, I get promoted to a supervisor. Um now I'm supervising massive projects, like $30 million projects, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm working alongside cops. <laughs> and, and it's just crazy because I'm actually, I have authority over the police that I'm working with because I am the supervisor of a state job and you're just a county cop. So you got to do what I say. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, you know, that was definitely interesting. I got a picture in my role somewhere <laughs> with the cops behind me, and I just came home. I'm like, <laughs> um, so there was that. And um, so now my ex, he winds up coming home. You know, I'm doing great by myself. 
And I'm thinking that, you know, all the stress that I put on this man before for having to help me, he doesn't have to worry because now I can help us. Mm -hmm. We're going to be okay. And um, some people like to be needed. Some people like you where you were when they met you, no matter how much they say otherwise. Because the moment that you do good, now you're forcing the people around you to have to do better, right? Because now they're looking at themselves because clearly they're judging you like you shouldn't have A, B, and C. So mm -hmm. therefore, I'm going to go harder and I'm going to make you feel like crap. So you understand that just because you have A, B, and C doesn't mean you're anything. That's what wound up happening. I wound up having a relationship that seemed like it came from a storybook when I was needy, right? When I was a young little single mommy who ain't had nothing. And then suddenly I'm good. And now what do you think? You're a man. What do you think? Because you make man money. You think you wear the pants, you know? And so I'm going through this nonsense. I bought my own house, you know? I get pregnant right after I buy the house. And now I, I now think that he wanted the baby just as a control tactic because, you know, I needed help and he wasn't helping me the way I needed help. And he came into a good situation when he came home, you know, he was okay. So he's not helping me. So I got to work until I'm eight months pregnant. And then right after I have the baby, I got to go back to work because I just bought a house. And this man who promised to help me ain't helping me. Mm. And um, so, you know, I went through that for about three years and COVID hit. And then I realized, you know, I, it, my mom's a gambler. So I grew up with, with card tables and everything like that. I know how to gamble. And I know that when your chips are low, right, if you're winning and you start dipping into your, your winnings, right, mm -hmm. You're supposed to get off the table. You don't necessarily got to leave the casino, but move away from that table. Exactly. Full. So that's what I did. I left New York because I'm like, you know, I'm having an issue with childcare. Baby daddy don't even want me to be in another, another relationship. And I'm going to lose my home because I don't have childcare. Mm -hmm. Right. And my job was very demanding. I had to be at work when they needed me at work. I was a supervisor. That was my job. And I could no longer be that person. And unfortunately, I lost my job. Well, got laid off and wound up with another company and the union's telling me I got to bite the bullet with working for free, basically, you know, I'm working through lunch and not getting paid. So I'm just like, what am I doing this for? I hit 40. What am I doing this for? So I got to Florida and I realized that working for anybody here was not even feasible because mm -hmm. it's the same cost of living as New York was that I left. Um, they, they've increased in prices here like three times the amount of money is what rent and, and buying a house costs now in Florida. But they haven't changed the pay rate. So it, you can't, you, you just, you can't make it. So what I did was um, in the process of selling my house, I, I, I wound up with a nice amount of money. You know, I walked away from that situation all the way up because the house doubled in value. I forgot to say that the house doubled in value. And that's why I was looking like, what should I do? Should I just keep on trying and maybe lose this house or walk away with this money and go start over? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I came here and I bought a tractor truck. Well, before I left New York, I also got my CDL. Then I came here and I bought a tractor and um, I have somebody who works for me and I take care of the books and I'm in the process of getting another unit. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a contract with um, a major furniture company wow. here. And so, um, so real quick. So, you 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 had a big job over in New York. It was a major Huge, job, yeah. you know. But yeah. you were still, like you said, you were on there. You were pregnant. You're still going to work because you said that the other half of you wasn't keeping up this end of the bargain. However, that eventually you were laid off, got with another company. But then you just say, you know what? I'm a summer house, and I'm going to start fresh in Florida. So here it is. You took another risk. You took another gamble. Not knowing what was going to be in front of you, but you took the risk anyway. 
Now, here it is. You made it out. You went down there with a the little money in your pocket, and you had to make a decision. Do I, you know, start something new? Or, or and like you said, you obtained your CDL. So you started, you kept accomplishing things at the accomplishing, even though things were still going on. You still had trials going on. You still had troubles that were coming. You still was going through the rain at times. You still was walking in the snow, but you kept moving. You kept trucking. And then here it is, you land in Florida, a new environment around new people, you know, and you decided to open up a trucking business. So tell us about that. You, you said you just said you have somebody working for you. You open up your trucking business. You're looking to get another unit. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, I wound up with a contract for a major furniture company, which I know actually are quite a few people who are ex felons that have a contract with the same business, um, mm -hmm. with the same company. The thing is, Florida, I have no record. Great. It's completely clean, completely like as if I've never been in any trouble. Now, that's also I haven't gone for a state job and I haven't gone for a federal job. So, you know, these preliminary background checks that these people are doing on a regular level, I'm coming up completely clean as if I've never nothing spotless. It's insane. To me. <laughs> um, but OK. So that's how it works. You go to another state, you've never been in trouble. You don't get in trouble. There's no reason for your stuff to come here. Yeah, yeah. Apparently the, the algorithms haven't picked up on it yet. I don't know what to call it. Yeah. Nonetheless. It's called, it's called being blessed. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> I think sometimes, so. sometimes we, we, we may, we may not understand what's going on, but sometimes when, and, you know, I don't mean to get off into a spiritual realm, but when you are anointed, you are called. Again, when you're called according to that purpose, nobody can open, you know, a door that God closes. Nobody can close any door that God opens. So you got to always say, hey, listen, I'm blessed in the situation that I am in currently because most people may not have that benefit. You know, oftentimes people try to say, well, what did you do? I want to compare myself to you and do what you did. But sometimes people don't know, like, hey, it's not going to work out the same exact way. You don't have, might not have the drive. You know, people tell me all the time, well, how can you doing? How are you doing your podcast like that? How, what made you come up with that? Well, even if you wanted to copy the podcast, you may not have the drive that I have. You may right. not have the availability that I may have. You right. may not have the thought process. So you can't never compare yourself. I always tell people that all the time. So. My thing is, I, I really appreciate you sharing how you never gave up, even though you 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 know it's like more so you were asking for more faith when you were faithless. You know what I'm saying? God remained faithful when you were faithless. So it, it's like wow, you know this really this really inspires me in a way too to keep going too. Like wow, just keep going, no matter what people say, no matter what dirt people throw on you, you keep going. Sometimes you may not know or understand, but it's, it's a divine purpose. Again, purposely driven. So keep going. I want you to keep going. Right. And before so, we start, yeah, we got a couple of, yeah, Mr. James Baker here and the message just says, he said, good, uh, great message. Um, uh, thank Samantha. you. Yeah. Thank we you. Got people on Instagram, I mean, uh, yeah, Instagram as well. They're clapping it up. They say, yes, you are blessed. And they appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, since I've been here, it hasn't been, you know, I just say that the struggle looks great now. It's still a struggle. It's not easy. There are 1000% so many times since all of this has happened that I, I'm not going to lie and pretend that I've never struggled in this because 1000% I have been, I've been in some really like hard situations where how the hell am I going to get out of it? I've, I've got a kid who's very, you know, she's got a lot of health issues and, you know, my private insurance wasn't covering one of her shots that cost $1,700 biweekly. So, you know, it was just like, what do I do? You know, and, and you think about going back to what you know, 
because you know there, there's money to be made out here think about them ppe loans and all of that stuff yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you know the reality is it's overcoming the temptation it is fighting the good fight it is constantly doing the right thing see now you asked me something earlier about what was going through my mind while i was gone but i never date a drug dealer again and this and that no 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 no. you know what went through my mind all the things that i did that i never got caught for this is my karma this is my karma and I still have things to pay back. I still have debts that I have to pay. Spiritual debts. How many lives did I help ruin? Mm. You know what I mean? And I didn't even consider that because I I just figured if I didn't give it to them, somebody else would. No, 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 no. There were children that were affected by my choices and I had no idea because I was an affected ch child by somebody else's choices. Hurt people, hurt people. Nonetheless, you're still accountable for the hurt that you give. You understand? So with that being said, I took that into mind and I came home and I had that in my mind. And anytime that I was attracted to a man, I ran from him because I knew I was attracted to no good ass men. So, <laughs> uh -huh. so for a little while, I just stayed to myself and I grinded really, really, really hard. And I think that that was the key to my success was that that tunnel vision of yes. I am not going to allow myself to go backwards. I have to go forward. And, and, and I think the most vital thing, the vital principles of my life is I know the destination that I have. I know the legacy that I want to leave behind. I know where I want to go. So this is the deal. And this is where I learned this GPS on your phone. You know, you can say that you want to go have fun tonight, right? And you can type into your phone places to have fun, and it's going to give you a million places. Uh huh. Keep going. But until you put in an address, they can't guide you nowhere, right? You mm -hmm. need an address so you can have a direct route. So now, once you have an address to where you're going, right? No matter what's happening on your way there, so. If there's construction, there was an accident, the road is shut down or whatever, you know how to detour you. The thing will reroute you because you know where you're going. It doesn't stop because things are happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think that people really need to take into consideration. Life is filled with happenings. We were promised, it says it in the, in the Bible and I mean to be in the spiritual realm. I mean to be talking about this because the fact of the matter is it's a real thing. We are not fighting against regular things here. These are things that we cannot even comprehend that's happening in this world around us. And despite what's going on around us, despite corruption and chaos and, and, and controversy, despite all of that, when you're doing what you have to do and you're staying focused on your goal and your destination, and you're taking care of your blessings that you've been blessed with, I promise you the universe will conspire towards you. The universe will work for you. It's just a real thing. I'm living it. I don't deserve this. I fall short all the time. I cuss like a sailor. I am not married and I am in a relationship. You know what I mean? Like, I don't deserve this. Yeah, yeah. And God loves me so much. That's powerful. That's powerful. And you share some great things. And here we go, Miss Johnson right here. She says, amen, sister. Going within is the key. You know, everybody's enjoying what you're saying right now. And I know uh, the, the, uh, James, Dr. James Baker he said, come on, uh, uh, Samantha. Yeah, he's telling you to preach now. now he, yeah. he's, a, he's a pastor now. And he's a, yeah. he's a leadership coach. He's, one, he's, a, he's a high influential person over here. Um, up here in the um, East Coast. Well, I mean, well, I'm quite sure you know where we at. But listen, we are you about you preaching? I'm about to go grab my 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 org, my piano, and start backing you up now. <laughs> well. you are preaching, but uh, but yeah, but we're definitely coming up on top of this hour, uh, Miss Samantha. I know we have like about five minutes, um, but for the most part, um, if you could, and I know you just addressed. Um, a lot of, of what you felt, you know, that a lot of people had to hear. But 
if right now, if you could say a couple words to individuals that's listening, that's uh, probably in the halfway house or recovery home, uh, looking to come home, uh, what type of words of encouragement uh, could you uh, give them? Um, my greatest advice, the greatest thing that I could give to anybody going through this process is to believe in yourself. Again, figure out what you want in your life. And it doesn't matter if it is in alignment, what society says is good. I'm saying what works for you, what makes you happy. Sit with that, figure that out. Come up with a, a, a very clear visual of what it is that you want. Write that down and then work backwards on the things that you got to do to get there. And then when you make it to that very last step, that's where you start and you don't stop and don't let nothing get in your way. Listen, I got my college degree through all of this. I got promoted. Some people tell me it's because I'm white. That's nonsense because my rap sheet says I'm not. You understand? It, it, it's all about what you want in your life and you are the ultimate author of your story, you give people permission to help you or to hurt you. People will only do what you allow them to do. So this is the deal. You do what you got to do and don't worry about nobody else. Mm -hmm. And when they tell you no, you say yes. And when they say no again, you say why not? And when they say no again, say I'll be damned. Right. <laughs> I oh, yeah. want it. And it's mine. <laughs> hey, Mr. Samantha, I've got to be honest with you. Now here, they say she is a preacher. They say they're sharing <laughs> this. And I, I can't wait for you to come out with your self-help book for people to learn from. I Thank really you. see you as being a mentor or a coach, you know, that can really inspire a lot of women, a lot of young ladies that's been through what you've been through. It's very seldom you have individuals that can re be, that can actually be relatable from both ends, from both right. sides, being a teenage mother, coming out, you know, throughout the, the drug uh, pandemic, coming out, you know, through changing your life, but then still getting caught up, even when you didn't even ask for it, you know, but then coming out and, 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 and embracing the reentry, you going after jobs, getting jobs, landing uh, positions of authority. Look at Joseph, you know, he went away for something he didn't do. But here it is. He came in, 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 in second command, second in command, you know. But again, I can't wait. That, that's a definitely I see you really coming out with a book uh, that's going to inspire the world. If, if, if nobody's never told you that or even told you to write a story, um, even if you don't know how to write a story, because I'm a ghostwriter. I need story. a publisher. I've been trying. I and need one. And we'll, <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk more about that, you know. Um, and I'll give you my point of views about publishing and things like that. Um, but definitely, this this has been a powerful broadcast with you sharing your wisdom, your experience. And that's what this is all about. The Reentry Connect podcast is about informing others, enlightening others, giving other people understandings of resources, letting people know if we did it, they can do it as well. You know, even if it's not on a big scale, everybody wants things to be up on a huge scale. I want to make billions of dollars, this, that, and the third. But why make all these billions of dollars and you're not happy? Why make right. all these billions of dollars and you can't even, you know, take care of yourself mentally, right. physically, you know, right. spiritually? You know, why gain all this stuff and lose your soul? For what? Right. You know, right. why are you going to profit the whole world, you know, just to lose your soul? What, 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 what does it mean? But again, we really do thank you. Like I said, we're coming up on this one minute mark because we've been on it for an hour. And yes, sister, yes, you can preach. You can talk. You can preach. I mean, we all can. And there's no, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that, you know, because everybody had to hear this. And I'm quite sure people are going to be tuning back in. People are going to be asking questions. And I know, um, so if, if everybody wanted to t tune into your, your social media, your social media would be under what name? Samantha Saro, Samantha Saro on Facebook. Um, you'll find me Samantha Saro on Instagram as well, but it's really very pretty hard worker with no vowels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> LinkedIn, I'm Samantha Saro. Uh, Twitter, uh, I'm there too. Uh, yeah, it's my name. 
That's cool. That's cool. Well, Miss Samantha, we really love having you uh, tonight. Uh, but we definitely got to come to an ending um, here at the top of the hour. But we're definitely going to have you back because we definitely want to have you on some round uh, roundtable talks. Definitely, you know, because you have a sure. lot of inspiration, a lot of, of knowledge that you can give people. But without further ado, I'm your host, Keenan Hudson, here with the Reentry Connect podcast, purposely driven with Miss with Miss Samantha Sarrow. And everybody, now you're just.